following is an exclusive presentation of the Ultimate Hoops Podcast Network. We're here, Candid with Candace Wiggins. It's your host, Candace Wiggins, and Reed Nelson here with me, and we're going to just keep the conversation going. So, uh, we learned a lot about you last week. Um, I, I know that many m- many of our listeners are listening to this episode potentially right after because we're releasing it at the same time. But for me, it was last week, um, and we ended uh, well. We ended with a lot of things. Yeah, we sure <laughs> did. We ended around middle school. Yeah. Um, I, I I I'm personally curious to make it all the way through. Uh, you know, your playing career, which just ended. Yes. Um, and let's let's get into high school. All right. Okay. So you're still in San Diego. Yes. Correct? Yes. And we talked a little bit about last week about how you were playing more. I mean, did they called it AAU then still, right? Yes. Well, I only played in one AAU tournament, which, by the way, we won. That was 13 under. That was going into my senior year my, uh, in high school. And actually, crazy story about my one AAU championship, 13 and under. It was in Orlando at the Disney Wide World of Sports. And we ended up playing. That was when I first met Candace Parker. Shout out to Ace, Candace Parker. That was the first time I ever saw her play. She was playing for the Naperville Jaguars, the purple team. You know, she was about probably 6'3", 13 years old. And that was when I got crushed because <laughs> everyone was like, Candace. And it was, I, was the, I became the other Candace, that, that tournament. But we ended up winning. We won the whole thing. Her team got third place. We ended up playing um, the Central Jersey Hawks in the finals. And a fun fact about that tournament, Disney was recording this TV show called Totally Hoops. I don't know if anyone who uh, remembers that show, but we were featured in it too, and we beat the team to get to the finals. But so yeah, so AAU was that was the only time I ever played AAU. Okay, but when you were playing with your select team, yes, what what was that technically? Was that not AAU? No, you know we we didn't really have. We didn't really have an AAU team because we just, I don't know, for some reason, ever since, you know, after that eighth grade winning the AAUs, I never went back to the AAUs after that. It was always just um, in high school tournaments. We we would go to, you know, just different tournaments throughout. But we were called the La Jolla Waves, our team. And it was just my, my high school coach, Terry Bamford, she just brought all of the talent in San Diego um, pretty much surrounding by our, t- our high school team, and we just turned that into a club team. That allowed for us to just really focus on developing the talent that we had at our school. It was a really small private school. I went to La Jolla Country Day, and it was really good start for me in my career to just sort of, you know, be the leader. And I had experienced playing on all these different AU teams that were possible AU teams, but it didn't really work out. You know, I played on this West Coast All-Star team that featured some of the top, all of the top talent in LA. And what I would find is I would went, we went to the Deep South Classic, which was at Duke, North UNC, and North, NC State. And you know, when, it's an, when you're on another team, when you're playing on an AU team, sometimes, especially if the coach has a daughter where he's coaching his daughter and we were, you know, you're in the same position as them, this is really important for this for the recruiters, the colleges to see you, you know. So I just found myself on teams where maybe I wasn't getting as much playing time as I would have liked playing on the on the bigger, larger scale teams. So just decided to just stay local, stay local, and then that way I could sort of build my own career and, and get a lot of experience on my own. When okay, so when did you realize that? Oh, here let, let, let's ask it this way: When did colleges start recruiting you? <laughs> Uh, it started pretty pretty early, you know. I I would say my first experience of being recruited was in ninth grade, the summer after ninth grade year. I was 14 years old, and I went to the UCLA team camp. UCLA was the first college to recruit me. We went to the team camp, and right then and there, after the the camp was over, it was me and Noel Quinn who ended up going to UCLA, and I played against her in the Pac-10, but uh, Kathy Olivier was the coach then, head coach. She sat me down. I had all my UCLA gear and basically just offered me a, a scholarship right there on the spot. And I was 14 years old, like, wow, UCLA. You know, it was really it was really awesome. And then after that, they just all sort of started 
coming in, you know, flooding in. And it was a lot of it was just conversation. But there was only one school that I wanted to get recruited by. And they were kind of, um, it was the next year. They were waiting for me to, to see kind of how I developed. And that was Stanford. Oh, Stanford, okay. Yeah. So um, talk about your high school team. Yeah. How much success did you have? What was the experience like? Oh, it was amazing. Well, of course, first of all, I have to say I was very fortunate to have a coach, the, the best coach in, in high school basketball, Terry Bamford, as my coach, because she really set the foundation in me as a player. She, she Every single day was a joy playing for her, and she understood my goals. We, she understood what I wanted. In my school, uh, Rashawn Salam went to my high school, and he, he won the Heisman at Colorado in football, and he had this big banner, the Rashawn Salam banner on the wall in the in our gymnasium and as early as you know seventh grade eighth grade ninth grade I would just look at that banner every single day and I would just say coach Terry coach what can I do to get on that wall like I need to be on that wall how can I get on that wall and the coach just looked at me and said win the Heisman and ever since that moment you know we just kind of shared she knew where I wanted to go in my career she knew that I wanted to be special like Rashawn was and so she just kept making sure that she every single day we worked as hard as we could. And I would say, though, right away, quickly, uh, as a freshman, I was 13 years old as a freshman because I skipped a grade, so I was much younger, but quickly became the leading scorer in, in San Diego. I think I averaged around, you know, 25 points a game. It was just, you know, kind of the same thing. It was really easy, though. It, high school basketball was so fun. It was easy. We played in small a small division in Coastal League, and so it was just very, you know, the talent wasn't necessarily as prevalent as it, as it was for the bigger divisions. And we had one rival, Bishops, and we had a couple of games where we lost a few games, but I just felt fell right into place as a freshman. It didn't matter. We went up to the Bay Area that year. We played... Um, Stanford actually came to the to one of those games and we we just started playing against highly talented teams and I got a chance to really see how big high school was but by the end of my freshman year we had made it to the state finals and we won we won the state championship and I was the leader of the team then and it was pretty cool it was a pretty crazy experience just being a freshman leading your team to state even though like it was a small division but still so I would say that quickly I became a leader and understood, you know, kind of what it took. How many, uh, I mean, did, was that the only state championship that La Jolla Country Day won? We won a second one the next year, and then we made it to the finals, the state, following two years. But so the second year we ended up playing the Paris Twins, um, Ashley and Courtney Paris, and, the, and we ended up winning that game. And I had, you know, 38 points. It was so great to repeat. And then the following two years we just fell short. And then the se my senior year, we ended up playing Piedmont, the Paris Twins again, and they got their revenge, and they won that that game. So why why a small school? Like, why not go against the, the top competition? Now, I, I'm assuming that, yeah. the, that the bigger schools had better competition. I, I don't yeah. know that for a fact. I, in Minnesota, it's that way. Yes, and you know, it, now it's totally changed, and I really feel a, a huge part of that change because now La Jolla Country Day in my school, when, back when I was playing, I had a I had a bigger vision. Sometimes I see things before they really happen, and I people probably don't really understand. Like, well, why would you go there? But it, I just felt like I could help build something great. It was a very small school that wasn't was laughed at or talked about. Oh, they're not very competitive at all. And by the time I left, we became the most competitive school in San Diego. Still to this day, we're ranked number one in San Diego since I've left, which is amazing. They've won another state championship, and they are now in the open division in CIF. So, so I just went to it this year. La Jolla Country Day played Long Beach Poly, which is one of the biggest high schools in the country for a state. So that's where it's come to now, and I really feel a huge part of that. And I just saw, I don't know, I, I, I like to take things that maybe seem impossible and make them more possible like I want wanted to I'd like that challenge and even as a young 13 year old I felt like this was a challenge that I could do that I could revolutionize some kind of way this the the small school you know um environment in San Diego and and with Terry on my side we really did and and so yeah I think at the time it was a little bit 
it, it, we did have to fight a lot of things, and a lot of people were just overlooking us, but now everyone knows La Jolla Country Day's name. You said um, a bigger vision. Yes. So even at 13? Yes, even at 13. You know, that you got to remember, I was looking at Rashawn Salam thinking, okay, I'm going to win the Heisman. Like, I really believed. You have to believe the crazy thing, the unbelievable, in order for it to happen. You You just have to, and you have to trust each step of the way and you cannot skip ahead you have to live in the now but I believed I could win a Heisman as a girl as a little tiny little girl so yeah I did believe <laughs> so you know a, a lot of us myself I'll say look back at when I was younger not necessarily 13 but you know 17 18 mm-hmm. 19 20 21 and be like man what was I thinking <laughs> do you do you have those moments or, or do you feel like you always always were kind of thinking a step ahead Yes, definitely always thinking a step ahead. I can even remember first day of high school at La Jolla Country Day. Even the kids, we were at this, you know, we're very privileged to be at one of the top schools in San Diego. I didn't take that for granted. I remember being, my first class was English class, and Mr. Pritzker was our teacher, and he came in and he had a he had this Stanford sweater on because he came from the Menlo School from the Bay Area, and he transferred to our school. And as soon as I walk in, he's staring at me. He's got his Stanford. He's like Stanford, and and I was right there with him. I I knew then like I'm gonna study each each class each day is gonna be preparing myself for Stanford first day of high school, as a, you know as a freshman. And I could tell the kids around me had no idea in the direction in their life. And you have to prepare for things. You're not sure how it's gonna happen or what's gonna end up being, you know, coming to fruition. But you have to have a vision you have to have a clear vision for yourself and you have to have a sense of direction so I had that and I knew that and I think it might have even started earlier in my life around my my dad's funeral I think is my earliest memory of knowing that I have to kind of be ahead of the game when the kids my age had no idea of death or anything like that was going on laughing and and I kind of had a seriousness about me that okay I've got to be really, you know, I've got to be aware. This is something, you know, just something was different then that triggered. Sure. What, what, and I'm assuming you have an answer to this question. What moment did you know you were going to Stanford? What, what, what was the moment where you're like, yep, that's the one? <laughs> when I got the call from Tara that my application had been accepted. <laughs> Other than that, I really, but okay, but okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I understand what you're asking because <laughs> you're never sure until you're in. I would say the moment that I knew that there was no way I was going to die before I didn't get into Stanford was my freshman year. We went, like I said, to the barrier for this tournament and our coach got us tickets to Maples to a game, to a Stanford game. So that was the first time I ever went to Stanford's campus. And I'll never forget, we were at the very top of Maples. We sat at the very, the highest seats and I think we, I just went straight to the top and I just sat and I just watched the game. And that was back when they had the bouncy floor. I don't know if you ever heard about it, but Stanford had this really cool bouncy floor at Maples Pavilion that they took away in 2004 because of like controversy about, you know, knee damage and stuff. But it was really cool because it would just bounce and uh, they had springs on the floor. But I watched that game and I remember seeing just everything about it, the environment, the the noise, the the crowd, just something about the crowd was so prestigious. Something about them being the top academic school in the country with the with the top basketball, women's basketball program in the country. And there was Tara Vanderveer, you know, who I watched in the ninety six Olympics, who I was just fascinated with Tara. Tara was everything to me. She was the answer to all of my questions. She was the resource, the the source of all sources. You know, the 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 Phil Jackson of women's basketball, really, in my opinion. And I just watched this game and I just said, I have to, like my envy for the the players that were playing, I just wanted to belong so badly. And I th- I'd say that's probably when, but I held it so secretively because it's a very scary goal to set because you're just afraid that you're going to be rejected. I mean, uh, and be honest, because I know you will. Yeah. How much of it, because you, because you said a, a lot of it was the academics. How yes. much of it, like, if you, could, if you could percent it for us, it was 50% academics, 50% basketball program. How much of it was the fact that 
you know, Stanford is known for their academics. How much of, of, of your decision was that? Oh, I would say, I would think I would have to say 50, 50. And, and, but, but for me, that's the reason why it was such a huge thing because it was so balanced. Like they, as great as they were in basketball, women's basketball was as great as they were ranked in, in the world. It, that's the rare rarity of Stanford though. So for me, it was, it was, it was a same passion. I went to class every day with the same passion that I went to practice. I don't think that many athletes do that. I don't know if any, I seriously was that, and that is the pursuit that I was facing at Stanford. And it really was 50, 50. I wouldn't say, you know, I, I would be lying if I said it was, it was more, it was really, really, really balanced for me. And I had that same amount of focus, but because it was 50, 50, because it was honestly 50, 50, a lot of my basketball suffered because of that too. I really did put a lot of focus in school and making sure that came first, just in terms of energy. And so it almost was like I had to double up with basketball because a lot of people were fit or 100 or maybe, you know, 80 percent or 75, 25 school or, you know, 80 if they're being really honest. But that 50 50, I mean, I, that subtracts 50 percent of all the players that were 100 percent basketball. I lost 50 half of the battle there. Okay, let's go into that a little further. Yeah. Um, how how much, I mean, you, you obviously had a very storied career. How, how much better could it have been? And I mean, I, I'm not yeah. advocating for, because obviously this is great. Yeah. You know, I mean, to, to, to hear that is sort of refreshing in a way, because I don't, I mean, A, I've never heard it, but I don't know, I don't know if it ever actually probably <laughs> yeah. happened before. I'm sure it right. has. It's mm. just very rare. Uh, how much better do you think you could have been? I think I could have been, Number one, I think I could have, if I would have just focused all of my energy on basketball and not pursued anything that has to do with, with school or, or didn't have the same passion, I think I would have just been, I think I would have been more of a, like a, my game would have been flashier. I would have been a different type of player. I would have been like one of those, the player is probably perfect for the professional game, you know, just just having that, that putting all of that passion and all that focus and energy that I put into school, putting into my game and making my game be its own language, really. You know, I really kind of stopped at the fundamentals because I just wanted to be skilled. I wasn't trying to be more than that. And I could tell a lot of the other players in my class and, and the girls I was competing against, they had more flash. And I think that was lacking for me because... I just kind of stopped. There was a point where it was like, okay, how, how extra, you know, I just was keeping things very simple, you know, in my, in my, and I think, you know, that ends up helping you, but then it ends up kind of hurting you too, because at the end of the day, the game is, you know, it's the Kyrie Irving type play that really seduces the crowd. So do you, what's your, I mean, here, here, let me ask you this. What's your, what's your, what's your number one, highlight from from Stanford and and keep in mind I'm, I'm going to ask you the opposite as well I, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to ask you kind of the top and the bottom what okay. what what was the best moment at Stanford the best moment at Stanford um would probably be oh there's now let me say something there was so many moments pretty much every single second of being on the court at Stanford was living a dream for me. I was living on in a, in a cloud. I was so happy. No joy could ever match that ever in my life. It was just utopia. I was so happy. But I would say that the top, top, top moment that if I could relive over and over again would be that last game when we made it to the Final Four. Because that game was everything that game was the reason why I chose Stanford over Duke like my mom wanted me <laughs> you know at first everybody was telling me and everybody and I say everybody I mean everybody every family member every friend everyone in this world that d didn't get it and didn't understand anything that I do and people still don't understand anything I do but 
were saying, you know, why would you do that? Why would you go to Stanford? They haven't been. They're not. You're never going to go to the Final Four. That's what they would tell me. You're never going to make it to the Final Four. You'll never get there. And I just got so angry at hearing never, 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 never. And that just became my whole goal. Like for four years, I dedicated myself to one goal is breaking that never statement. And I knew it was going to be very, very difficult. I knew it. It was almost impossible. So that game, when we, when we were, the seconds were counting down and I just thought about how I was, I got there my like very last try, the end of my senior year, we're here, we did it. We're, he, we're going to the Final Four. Stanford is going to the Final Four, and I helped lead them. That was the top of moment for me. And to have, you know, 41 points at the time, I didn't even know I, was, I scored that much. I didn't even care. I didn't, it didn't even, it all just kind of was like a dream. And so that was, I would say, was, is the top moment for me. And since then, you know, Stanford's been a contender. They went to the Final Four every year after that for, I think, six years straight, that to me, you know, it's not necessarily what even you do when you're somewhere, but what happens after you leave that I think really signals something special. So so Tampa Bay, correct? Yes. Okay. So you're in Tampa Bay. You're playing Tennessee. Yes. The national championship game. So uh, Candace Parker was yep. on Tennessee. Yeah, um, she was. Do you, do you and a whole bunch of other players, <laughs> not just Candace. <laughs> People forget. Do you remember how many points you scored in the tournament? In that finals game? No, in in the in the entire tournament. Cause oh I'm, no! Because I'm seeing here that yeah. you, that you're the top scorer that oh. you're in in that oh. in the tournament. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. 151. Oh. That's Should a lot. have had a lot more. I missed <laughs> so many. Lay- the game when I had 44, I was looking at the game again. I should have had 60. <laughs> I okay. missed so many layups and free throws. I could kill myself. So, uh, I'm gonna ask a very cliche question okay. that. I feel like I know the answer too, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Was it better to make it that far and lose? Or would you rather, you know, and, and have that loss in the national championship game, which I can assume is is a tough pill to swallow? Or would you have rather said, you know, maybe losing in the first round game wouldn't have been too bad? No way. Sorry. <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I I feel honored to have lost in the finals game. Do you understand how much people do not understand how much Tennessee, their identity is winning championships at Stanford. Our identity is not in winning championships. We felt we all felt like we won the national championship the day we got the call that said our application had been accepted. Everything else with that is a bonus. When you're a Stanford athlete, it's a totally different mindset. So they wanted it way more than we did. In fact, I remember standing at the circle. I knew we were going to lose that la- the championship game before the ball even got tipped because I knew it. I knew it. And I and I actually had very much peace because like I always say it's always about the journey and not the destination. And our journey was spectacular and we accomplished everything that we had dreamed of accomplishing. But I remember we were going to lose that game when I saw first of all they had five seniors on their team, maybe five or six. They were all so hungry. They were all so hungry for the WNBA draft that was going to take place the next day. They had so much to prove. Besides Candace, none of, no one else on that team had really proven their value to the draft. So they had this was their last and final attempt to say, we are great too. We're just as talented. We need it. We deserve this because this is livelihood now. We're going, we're going right from college to the WNBA in 24 hours. So it wasn't even about necessarily the NC2A championship game. For a lot of these girls, it was about their life and their careers. So it was a lot more on the line than I would say any of the players on my team. We only had myself and Sissy Pierce, another senior on the team. And, you know, that was it. So I was the only senior. Everyone else on our team was so young that they didn't really have that same, you know, hunger to win as as all those girls did. Shannon Bob and Alexis and Nikki and Asiki and those guys. And I remember when I the moment I knew we were going to lose, uh, we were just standing around in the huddle, you know, uh, about to tip off matching up on the circle. And I'm on the I'm on the line. I'm on the line. And Alexis, Alexis Hornbuckle is right here next to me. And I look down on her shoes, on her toes, on her shoes. And I'm like, well, we lost on her shoe. It says December 17th, 2007 or whatever date it was, I, I can't recall the exact date, 
And that was the day. And I saw that and I said, oh, man. That was the day that we had beaten them at Stanford for the first time in 10 years earlier that season. I had forgotten all about that game. Tiger Woods was at that game. He running around going crazy. I mean, the whole world was going crazy. We upset them and it was an overtime. It was just it was just one of the one of the great one of the great moments, I would say, you know, beating Tennessee after a 10-year drought, which was, was another goal of mine that I wanted to do, just get Tara back, you know, at, at the conversation with Pat Summit, legendary, amazing Pat Summit. And so when I saw Lexus have that date written on her shoes and permanent marker on both of them, I said, oh, this is over. You know, they they, they are so, they didn't let go and, and they, they remembered and we didn't have that same, we didn't just have that. It, it didn't mean that much, as much to us as it meant to them. And so I kind of just, after that, I, I just let go really then. So h- hindsight is obviously twenty twenty. I mean, and, and listen, I'm not, I'm I'm not. T- listen, did you really feel that way? Like, did you really? Because f- like you, you're yeah. you're obviously a huge competitor. Did yeah. you honestly feel that before the tip off the yeah. national ch- championship that you you were going to lose this game? Yeah, I did because there was five seniors to one senior, and when it's in those type of situations, that is what that is what changes things. It's the hungry. Tara Vanderveer taught me this. The hungry lion hunts best. We just were we were just outmatched by hunger. And there was a different dynamic to the Tennessee women's basketball team, just who they are and where they come from and, and who and you know, versus who we are and where we came from. I mean, it was just I knew that the odds were against us. I think the outside world probably didn't see it that way, but I did. I knew and I also knew that it's so hard to we were in so it, it was like we were playing so loose and then this game just became so intensified in pressure and you got to remember like i said it was one of me i was and i was young i was 20 years old then we've got all these freshmen and sophomores who these girls are 18 19 years old they're you know and then then you've got a whole team of 22 year olds who are determined to show that they i mean there's there it's it's very clear it was very clear to me I still, I still wanted to see kind of how the game went, and I, I was still going to compete. But when you have that much against you, like I had, I, I was able to let it go and say, okay, because it, it, I understood, I understood what, my, where my value and my identity wasn't in, is wasn't necessarily in winning games. And you know what's funny is because I've noticed that so many people put so much, so much um, importance. And and on that one game, on that one moment, that one moment changed the whole course of everything. And I recognize that now. And it's kind of like, you know, it, it's it could it, it's 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 crazy how history works that way, especially in basketball. Like you even look at the Cavs and Warriors finals game and how just history would have totally changed if the Warriors would have won versus the Cavs. I mean, everything would be different now. It's kind of the same way on a much smaller scale. In that in that regard, if I if we would have won that championship game, but like I said, when it comes to Tennessee and it comes to Stanford, this isn't the NBA, this isn't the WNBA, it's not high school, this is college. And when it comes to college, Tennessee versus Stanford at that moment in 2008, it just stan we just had a totally different identity than they did. Their identity was so much into winning a championship. They had been there before. They were hungry. There was so much more on the line that people just can't understand and see that I knew. I knew then. I've been thinking all week about what you just said about how, listen, Cavs Warriors. That was a that was a coin flip. Yes, at the end. it really was. Either team could have won that yes. game, but yet now LeBron's legacy slash yes. you know and Steph's legacy are going to be dependent on that it was a coin yes. flip yes it was a coin flip exactly it shouldn't matter we should not right. look at LeBron James any differently I absolutely agree and that is something that I really would like to call attention to because you know and listen it's going to be what it is people perception is reality if people perceive something then you know the masses and a lot of times people are delayed when it comes to things like this, but I'm not delayed. So, you know, I have to say it's the same thing. I really identify with Steph. I really, really do because it is not, you know, this, beca- this moment becomes bigger. This moment becomes his defining moment. And he knew it. He knew it too. He even said before the game, you know, I have to play 
the best game of my career. This is a career defining game, career defining moment. And I just hope that, you know, the world and, and Steph Curry, most importantly, doesn't fall into that whole thing because at the end of the day, it's it, it like you said, it, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. And even with LeBron, if LeBron would have lost, would that have been the end of the world for LeBron? I, I think that LeBron, his story is so incredible and what he's done. And, and, you know, Cleveland deserved that win for sure. They deserved that. The city deserved it. I was all in with them as well. But at the end of the day, I mean, people have to really take a step back and appreciate both sides winning and losing. They're both winners and they're, you know, they're both you know, and, and I just don't think people, we're, our, our culture and our society is so obsessed with winning and losing. And a lot of times I think people have a pers- that have a personal investment. People like seeing the person that they, for whatever reason, they are negative towards them. They like seeing them lose and it makes them feel, you know, as a spectator, it makes you feel like you have some sort of power over something, a situation. Or I don't know what it is about our culture that really loves You know, it's like we just divide winners and losers when it's really a lot more, it's a lot, the lines are a lot blurrier than people realize. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your college coach, Tara Vandeveer. Uh, When did you first meet Tara Vandeveer? I first met Tara Vandeveer at the Stanford camp. I came to the camp in the summertime after my sophomore year. So I was 14, I think it was 2000. 2002, maybe I was 15. That's when I first met her. But uh, I had, I think the first time that I saw her, that she made an impact on my life was definitely the 1996 Olympic Games. And I was very much engaged with Tara and became a little obsessed with Tara in in a way that from the television screen to a 10-year-old as obsessed as, you know, you can be watching her sideline, getting as many cues as you could we would watch their games in, in, in the 90s, and I would just be watching Tara. And I would wa- it was crazy because most kids, they watch the players, right? I didn't watch the players. Even the Olympics, I watched Tara because I just felt she just had commanded this. So I remember just, just watching her in, in any way. I could, she was, it was so quiet because the camera would never really, you know, it was just in any time I could have a glimpse. So I feel like I've known Tara for a lot longer than when I officially met her. What is, uh, what's, what's the number one lesson you learned from Tara Vandeveer? Oh, man. Wow. Uh, Tara has a whole series of Tara-isms that she could write a whole book on her Tara-isms. And so that's a really hard one. But I think that the, the one that sticks out to me the most, the one that always, it always comes forth whenever, you know, I'm in a, in a, in a situation, well, actually, I, I would say there's two. This was all in my senior year at Stanford because it took a long time for me to really, really understand. Like, Tara and I, we had a, our, our relationship was a journey, and it was an amazing journey from day one to the last day. But when I got to really mature age and, and I got my senior year, it, I, just, I just vowed to myself to soak in everything th- that she taught me. So beginning of the senior year, we did things a little bit different and she put little sayings on everybody's locker that was personally from her or the assistant coaches would do it too. But on my locker, she put my on mine and it stuck with me the entire, my entire senior year. And that was the hungry lion hunts best. Really she should have put it the hungry lioness. Cause I guess apparently the lioness hunt and the lion just kind of stands there and waits for them to bring in the kill, but you get the point. So the hungry lion hunts best. And that was all I needed to hear. You know, you just got to find a place where what drives you, what is making you hungry, where it is more important to you than it is to everyone else. So that was really helpful for me. And just it was like she clicked with me. We got it. We understood. And it was very simple. But then I would say that the most significant moment of Tara, what she did for me, this special, special moment was right before the NCAA tournament. In 2008, uh, it was right after the uh, winter quarter had just ended and I was doing, it was really tough for me just balancing school classes and that pressure because time out, the pressure at Stanford is unbelievable as a student, as a student, student athlete, yes, but as a student, I would get a lot of times when I would go to class, I would be so anxious and nervous about 
just, you know, belonging and making sure I don't say anything stupid or or feeling that I would sometimes I would get panic attacks or I would develop ulcers. I was just very stressed about it. It's very competitive. It's very competitive and it's it can be a little overwhelming, especially at that moment in my in my life. You know, I, I, I really it was really hard for me. So so we got the stress of school and just getting that feedback from from classes and then the NCAA tournament starting and just we hadn't gotten to the final four and just is Stanford going to do this is your my last chance to do it. Am I going to do it? Is Stanford going to do it? I, I felt like I was carrying Stanford on my back, literally the school program on my back. I felt that pressure and then. And it was a real pressure. It was really a thing. And um, it wasn't like an imagined pressure. And then I would say on top of that, the WNBA was stressing me out the whole entire year. I was putting it in the back of my mind, but it was stressing me out so much because here was this unknown world that I just felt like, do I even belong there? Can I even make it there? Like, what is that world for me? What is it going to be for me? And I could just, from time to time... You know, I would for for however however I got in, I would kind of hear the buzz about me in these other in these other world that murmurs and and a lot of doubt, a lot of people saying she won't do this on the next level. You know, I the only person I could imagine probably felt this way was like Reggie Bush. You know, I grew up with Reggie Bush. He went he grew up in San Diego. He's a year older than me. And I remember, you know, he was so good in high school and Reggie Bush. And then he go to USC. He's not going to be like how he is in Helix and USC. Then he wins the Heisman's great at USC. Oh, he's not going to be that great in the NFL. I kind of felt that same way of just, but, but hearing it and just not being sure of that either and not feeling like, just, fe- just feeling really scared about that, about, about what people are saying. Because like I know for sure, perception is reality. And I just knew that my perception was just really, really off when it came to the WNBA and that worried me tremendously with the WNBA is also the Olympics. And that was an Olympic year as well. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to be on the Olympic team and, and I just wasn't sure what was going to happen. You know, I, my, I was like building myself up just to get squashed. It felt like. So with all that in mind, I remember going to Tara and I was also struggling at home too with my, my mother and sister and just some home stuff that was really, really um, hard on me as well that really kind of delivered the last blow for me and I just kind of collapsed. It was the first time that I ever really broke down in front of Tara and I broke down and I just couldn't, I couldn't be tough anymore. I couldn't be, I couldn't do it. And I was really, you know, kind of worried because Tara's, she's a tough woman and she's not, you know, she's just, I just, I just didn't know, like, I, I felt like guilty for laying it all in front of her, you know, like she was going to have to clean this up and she, and she did. And, and what she said to me stuck, stuck with me for the entire rest of my life, including starting with the NCAA tournament, which is, I attribute the reason why I played so well in the NCAA tournament and scored the 151 points and all that was because of what she told me next. And she said, she just basically told me, you know, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Jennifer AZ. And that made me feel really good because, you know, she's Jennifer Aze is number one top. So she, you know, she said that, do you know the story about what happens to diamonds? You know, how they become diamonds. And, and she basically just said how, you know, coal, just a regular lump of coal under intense amount of pressure becomes a diamond. And it was just that simple, that process. I didn't know that story. I didn't hear that story before. I didn't know that. And that was just so simple. And she said, I want you to take all this pressure, all this pressure that you're under, you're going to be, you're going to become a diamond. You're going to, this is going to be, this is going to let mold you into being a diamond. And just, it wasn't even necessarily that story, but how she explained it and how she believed she knew, like she didn't, wasn't even worried. She says, I'm not even worried about it. Because I know that this process is going to create a diamond. You're gonna this is you're gonna be a diamond. And it was just you have to believe this. So as when Tara believed that and she explained it that way, then I began to believe it. And I said, you know what, I'm going to use this pressure. This pressure is going to be this is my moment and and the rest is really is really history. 
Are you one of the 99% of basketball players who never play professional basketball? Are you tired of trying to live your hoop dreams in the same old rec basketball leagues? At Ultimate Hoops, we believe that all basketball players should be treated like a professional. And with Ultimate Hoops League, we have completely revolutionized recreational basketball. With the Ultimate Hoops League, you'll get full online stats for every game, including box scores, videos, photos, power rankings, and your own personal profile that tracks your stats for your entire career. And you can compare your stats with the thousands of other Ultimate Hoops players across the U.S. and Canada. Most Ultimate Hoops Leagues cost under $100 a season, which includes eight regular season games played on Lifetime Fitness's professional quality basketball courts. No matter what your skill level is, the Ultimate Hoops League is the place to take your talents to. Join the largest recreational basketball league in America, the Ultimate Hoops League, by going to uhlife.com to get started. A new season starts in July, so go to uhlife.com now and start getting treated like a professional today. UConn. <laughs> okay. Now, UConn won the national championship this year, and they've won it. Was it three straight? I'm not sure. They've won a lot in Four the last. Four straight, I think. They've won yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, their sports center's on down here a lot, and I know the big talking point, and I thought it was a little bit silly, but then I thought about it. I'm like, maybe it's not. Is UConn bad for women's college basketball? And by that, I mean, with them winning every single year, is that bad for women's college basketball? I don't think so. And I'm very confused about UConn winning four championships being bad for anything. I don't think so. No. And I know personally, I have a very, very strong relationship with UConn in terms of we played them twice. When I was at Stanford, we played them twice in the NCAA tournament once my freshman year and once my senior year. And the mystique, there's this mystique that comes with UConn. It's very real, and they have so much coverage. We had, like, two people covering us, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Jose paper. They had, like, 30 to 50 people following them, and that's great for women's basketball. They bring that attention. It's like... Think of this big, giant eyeball, <laughs> and that is the public eye. And whenever UConn goes, there's this big, giant eyeball that follows them, you know, and I think as long as the public eyeball doesn't get conjunctivitis, it's fine. You know, it's good. It's a good thing to have that, to have that spotlight, and I just don't really understand. I'd have to understand the argument as to why, because it's really confusing to me. I don't think that at all. I think that you can argue a lot of things, but arguing if they're bad for women's basketball is not one of them. I, I think the I think where people are coming from, or I mean, first off, yeah. sports centers just just looking for a talking point. Yeah. I mean, th- there's that, but it's like okay, they're getting all the recruits at this point, or not all of them, but a majority yeah. of them, and you know, it, it's nobody else is a uh, parody is always good for sports. Like if I come into a regular season and say, oh, my team has a chance to win the championship. That's good. Yeah. If I know that I'm just going to get worked by UConn every single year, that's not necessarily good. It's not a balanced league. But I love where you're coming from. You're just like, I'm just sort of confused by all this. Yes, because I, I just don't. You know, I think being someone who, who just, we played UConn, we, they're like a dragon to slay UConn. And we beat them. You know, Stanford, we beat them my freshman year. And it was... I, and then, so my point is, is that I just think that, um, and, and I know in the last four years they've won, they had Brianna Stewart uh, leading them, and but it's things change so much. Like, look about, look at UConn when Diana Taurasi was playing there. And Gino's favorite thing to say at that during that era was, we have Diana and you don't. So when we beat UConn, my freshman year that I was talking about, they didn't have Diana anymore. You know, you say they get all the recruits, but sometimes, you know, every season is different. So I remember that year when we played them in 2005, the year after Diana left, they didn't use that talking point anymore. They didn't have Diana, and we ended up beating them, and we beat them actually by 17 points. We killed them, and it was such a big thing or whatever, but it was, you know, every year is different, and things change as a wave, and this is UConn's time, and yeah, maybe they will continue winning, but... I certainly don't think I don't think so. I think that things change. It's always different eras. It was for Tennessee's era for a little bit, and then UConn came back, and obviously now they're they're starting this empire. But 
I don't know. I just don't think that. I think people are just wanting to, they see something at face value. They're not really diving deeper into it. I think that it's not, I don't think UConn's bad for women's basketball. If anything, I think it's great, the attention that they bring. And I think that, you know, they've, Gino has done a great job. I mean, he's brought prominence to a to a school and, and to the point where people know when you say UConn women's basketball, you know exactly what that means. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that or bad about that at all. And I have a feeling that, you know, with this, who knows what, who, what team is going to be the new dynasty. I teased this a little bit ago, um, but I never asked you. Yeah. Low point at Stanford. What was it? That's easy. That was my junior year. And my junior year, you know, I was feeling just, I, I think when you're an upperclassman in college or maybe even high school, you just start getting this antsy feeling. You're not, you're not young anymore, but you're not quite a senior. You losing a lot of your leadership because you're relinquishing it to seniors and, but you still feel very bunch, you know, so I was in that kind of like lost in in space not a not the Britney Spears not a girl not yet a woman part of my career and so the way I handled that and was that I decided to join a sorority at Stanford and I joined I pledged Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Ooh, ooh. shout out to all my sorors any sorors listening God bless you if you are (laughs) And I decided to pledge Delta, and it was, it's not like in a typical sorority. It's an all-black uh, sorority, and it was started in 1913 at Howard University. 22 women, 22 founders um, started this. And so it was the chapter at Stanford. It's called the Omicron Chi chapter. And the reason why I decided to pledge, because this is something that I have never talked about before, you know, to a public audience, but a big reason why I decided to pledge, was, well, it was many reasons, and it's a very personal decision so I won't get into that but one thing that was cool about Omicron Kai at Stanford was so many basketball players had pledged before me and you know and I and I was really like Val Whiting and Olympia Scott Naila um uh and it was it was amazing because the I just didn't realize that and I didn't you know just being a part of a sisterhood where so many athletes and Olympia was a you know, she was an all-american she played in the WNBA for a long, long career she had. And she, so just seeing all that and knowing that they had been through it. And I said, if they can pledge, I can pledge as well. And I really was in search of a, of a, of a deeper sisterhood than I was having even on the, on the basketball team. And yes, a basketball team is like a sorority, but there's a difference there. So decided to pledge Delta and it took a lot of my energy. It took a lot of, because it's a lifetime commitment. It's like a marriage and that's how you treat it. So it's probably, and everyone who asks me, they'll ask me, what's the craziest thing you've ever done in your life? And I'll say, pledge Delta while going to Stanford and playing basketball. That was the craziest thing I ever done because it was just, you know, I mean, two commitments and you really, it's it's just a lot. But because of that, I think a lot of my, I don't know, I just lost connection with my teammates maybe a little bit or for whatever reason, I just, I mean, I still played, I was still an All-American that year, you know, and, but we ended up losing in the NCAA tournament after being a high seed, a second seed, we had home court advantage at Maples and we ended up losing in the second round. Remember when you asked me earlier about would you rather go all the way to the finals or lose early and no way not lose early, especially in my home court. We lost that second round game and to Florida State and it was devastating. And I just felt, you know, that was when it kind of hit me where, you know, I just, it, it felt like, I wouldn't say those are too correlated, but I realized then that that is not the necessarily the experience I wanted. I played well and I was great, but there was something that I, I kind of realized that even though I love the, my sorority sisters and I love that experience that I had and I wouldn't trade it and I would do it again in a heartbeat, you know, it really kind of was a low point because, I don't know, I just felt like if I was a little bit more committed, what could have happened, what could have changed, and um, not feeling too much responsibility, but feeling just kind of bummed out that that happened. And it was devastating. It was really devastating. And, and that really was what triggered. So in a lot of ways, it's a good thing. I don't want to go and say that it was this terrible thing. Because in a lot of ways, if that doesn't happen, if I don't pledge Delta or, or, or let's put Delta out of it, if we don't lose in the second round at home at Maples Pavilion my junior year, 
do we make it to the final four the next year? I don't think so because that just was so sitting with me the whole entire time. And Tara and I had a talk that spring and she just, you know, when I was at the final four, cause I had been an all American and she just asked me like, do you want, what do you want out of your career? Do you want to just be here? Cause you're going to be an all American again, but do you want to bring your team with you? What do you want that experience to be? Do you want to just come to the final four every year and get your, uh, your all American trophy and feel great? Or do you want to feel like you brought everybody at Stanford with you? And I said, I want to bring everybody with me. And it was at that moment. And I remember seeing Candace Parker, she won the Wade trophy that year. And I wanted the Heisman so bad. And I remember just watching her get her Heisman and, and or the Wade trophy and just thinking like, I want that, you know, and just kind of reprioritize my life. And, and, but it was definitely a low point. I had to do a lot of, it was a lot of crying and it was a lot of pain that I felt at that moment. And it, it just kind of did feel like everything was slipping out of my hands and my, my dreams. So did you, did you blame yourself? No, I didn't. I didn't bring myself, but I did feel the burden of I can do more. I can do more. I can engage more. I know the personal reasons why I decided to pledge Delta, but I felt like and it was and it was great and it was exactly what I needed. And there's a reason why so many basketball players in Stanford's history have pledged Delta. It's an amazing organization. But I also recognized that there's more I could do. There's more I could do. I, I need to reach out more. I need to you know, treat my, my, my teammates and, and, and use the same things that I learned as Delta as being a sister in the sorority and apply that to my teammates. And then we kind of became our own sorority. Did you ever consider uh, coming out of Stanford early to, come, <laughs> to, 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 to enter the WBA draft? <laughs> Absolutely not. If I could have stayed at Stanford, I would, I would, I would have, I, I did not. I was like, like, dra- like they had to like drag me to the WNBA draft. I did not, I actually did not want to go to the draft. I didn't want to get drafted. So did you, I mean, did you not want to play in the WNBA? I mean, I mean, you kind of just yeah. said that, but yeah, I mean, yes and no, you know, I, I, yes and no. I, I mean, yes, yes, I did. But I was very worried because I had a feeling that it, things were going to be different and I had such a great experience, but I knew that there was no other way. It was Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. Okay. It's like you are in and then they're like, can we go back? Oh, oh no, you can't go back. You got to go forward to go back. So I knew that you had to just keep going forward. I knew that there was no way that there was no going back anymore. There was no, and, and I had been playing basketball my whole life. I remember when the WNBA started, I had been praying for a WNBA and it was right here in front of my face. So why all this anxiety now? And I had to keep asking myself that, why am I, why am I feeling like this? Like, what is going on right now? You, this WNBA felt a lifetime away when I was 10 years old, it felt like it was a lifetime away. I could just, oh, that's not going to happen until I'm 20. Like 20 feels like you're 100 years old when you're 10 years old. Oh, that's another whole life that I'm going to live before. And here it is. It's 20. I'm 20 years old. Here it is. So for me, it was like, you know, the the WNBA, it, it kind of came fast. And it was the day after my championship game. So I was really in a lot of pain and mourning already mourning our season and my my life that I had took so long to build at Stanford just kind of okay bye that's over and then it was isolating too because no one really understood what I was what what, what you're experiencing sure um so we're going to talk about that in 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 the next episode but I I I do want to I do want to circle in on, on one thing here and you said you were 20 years old when you were drafted. 21, I'm sorry. 21. Sorry. So you're very yeah. young. Yeah. Um, tonight is the, is the draft, is yes. the NBA draft. NBA draft, yeah. And there are 18-year-olds. Yeah. 19-year-olds. Yeah. Young 19-year-olds. How in general, and then this is kind of going a little bit off topic, but I think it's still interesting to talk about, <clears throat> how do we expect these young people, men or women, to be able to handle you know, the WNBA or the NBA at such a young age, is it even possible? I think it is possible, but with lots and lots of support and an understanding of psychologically what is happening and under an understanding, you know, there's got to be an education where they really, really are aware, but there's nothing that can prepare you for this. It is Willy Wonka. You have to just go through it 
and hopefully you don't drink a fizzy lifting lifting drink or whatever it's called and float and then you know it's like you just kind of have to go through it and and there's nothing really that can prepare you but I think with support that transition that it doesn't look so foreign and things just they're going to be it doesn't, you know, it's, it, it, it really is like going to the chocolate room and you can eat every, anything, anything is made of ca- chocolate and candy. And it's really, and then you just go and, and just not gorging yourself and just kind of, I think that's the only way that you really can make it through. But what 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old really is going to be like that. I mean, you just have to experience it. What advice would you give any of the deb- or any of the NBA players coming out tonight. What what's the one thing you would tell them? Enjoy the moment, but realize that you have once you're drafted, there's another you. It's another you. You're you're being reborn, and this is a business. It's no more amateur. You're no longer an amateur, and just know that that this is a business first, and you'll be great once you realize that and you see that part of it. Separate it from your whole rest of your life. What's the one thing you wish you would have done differently, starting with the time right after the national championship game of your senior year? Um, I wish I was more confident in myself. I wish I would have known that my talent was good enough, no matter what the world, that small world, made me feel, no matter what that made, well, no matter what you were made to feel you your talent was enough and I just always second guessed my talent because I was just felt like so different and I felt like just this weird energy and I just wish that I would have trusted my talent so more than I did uh, okay so 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 let's do this so um we okay so it's the night before the draft. So you would, game, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, I mean, so I mean, yeah. you are you are going to bed the night before the draft. Now, really, the morning. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, it didn't. <laughs> it is, wasn't. Yeah, this is sort of a microcosm of what we're going to do right now because okay. we're we're going to talk about the draft next next week, next episode. Okay. What was it that you were thinking? Because I mean, I you had just lost the national championship game. Yeah. And the draft is tonight. Were you? Because was uh, where was the draft being held? At Tampa Bay at oh, that it time, was. yes, oh, very they, nice. they, yes, they would. Th- at that point, I think um, a couple of years later, they ended up making it where all the, they changed everything. Now the WNBA did, thank goodness. But you know, it took them a while to kind of understand how that impossible it is to completely one more one night be playing in a championship game, and then the next morning you're being drafted. Like that is too. Mu- it's too soon. It was. It's way to Alice in Wonderland. And so they changed it now. But back then, they used to have the draft held at the same location as the Final Four. Okay. So you basically, you're going to sleep at a, at a Tampa hotel or whatever. Yes. And then you're going back. That, I mean, what, what, what was more on your mind? The, the loss or the fact that tomorrow night you're getting drafted to the WMEA? Neither. My teammates, we all hung out in my room and it was just a party. It was just a little private party of all the people who helped me get there. Me just acknowledging and just living and just holding on to that moment as much as I could. I did not care about the championship. I really did not care that we lost the championship game. I did not care. I was so proud of the women that I was with. I, they're, they're my lifelong friends. They are everything to me. The reason why I was so successful at Stanford was because they set screens. They would pass me the ball. They would make sure that I was good. They had my back. And I wasn't sure if it was going to be like that in the next level. I knew more than anybody, just like Steph Curry. We're going to go back to him for a second. I, the best thing that I loved about Steph was when he broke the record. I think it was two years ago he broke the, you know, he broke it again this year. But his shooting record, you know, most threes in a season. First thing he does, he thanks his screens. He thanks the guys on his team for setting the screens. Thank you. And he was straight then. He said, not me. It's thank you guys who set those screens for me because I, that's how I got the open shots. I was just same way my success was so dependent on the screens that were set the plays that were ran the passes that were made to me to get those shots so for me I knew that I knew that my teammates were such a huge part of my success 
the outside world didn't know. They're thinking that I'm just Jordan or something. Like I'm just this great player on my own, which, you know, I have talent. I know that I am talented, but I also knew better than everyone else why I was successful at Stanford. What was that? And I, I mean, I think we use the term party loosely or or do not use the term party loosely was it was it a party i mean oh no not like a oh that's yeah. party no 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 <laughs> it was it wasn't like that at all it was just very just chill we all were just sitting around and everybody just kind of came and i was i was really sad but i was trying to be in good spirits but it was over for me and i was really sad it was it wasn't a pity party but it was just fun it was just us it was just our stanford team being us one last time and just i was just holding on to that innocence so uh, obviously you had just gotten done with a very, very, very busy season. Yeah. <laughs> one in one, which that did you went to the national tournament or the national championship game, excuse me. Did you know who had the number one pick in the draft the, the next day? Did, did you know who it was? <laughs> I actually, I think I, I might have known, but not, I think like my, my uncle or somebody was like, oh yeah, LA. Like everyone knew who had the number one pick. And I don't think, I certainly didn't know who had the second and third pick, but I think I first remembered hearing that LA had the first pick like the day of the draft and I was just like and then and then I was and then this is why I didn't like it because you just don't trust anybody you feel like everything's being told to you in attractive lies like oh yeah I think LA would want you now can you know it's just you hear things like that and you're like but I would probably pick Candace Parker over me and I would pick Sylvia Fowles over me. So you just kind of, but then you're hearing all this stuff. And so I just, that's when I just shut down because I wasn't, I didn't sign up to be judged like this. You know, you just feel so judged. Did, did you, this is a weird question to ask, but did you have a preference for where you wanted to live? Because I mean, essentially where you were now, granted, this is only a, f a, f a three or four month season, yeah. but you're going to be moving to this place like and almost immediately. Gonna, yeah. And this is like, this is where you get drafted to. This is, this is your, this is, this is you. This is your identity now. And um, no, I didn't have a preference. I didn't even think about that stuff. I woke up that morning sad that I, that I was driving. I remember driving in the car to the draft with Kate Pay, our assistant coach and Tara they were trying to cheer me up. I was like, I was driving to my funeral. It felt like that. I really did. And Kate was trying to cheer me up. She was like, like Kate only can. She played in the WNBA. She was a walk-on at Stanford, earned her scholarship, earned uh, her, she got drafted. She went to the WNBA and played for the Storm. And she was just, she loved her time in the WNBA. So she was just telling me all these stories and how much fun it is and all that stuff. And I was just looking at her like, that's you, Kate. I don't. I don't feel like that. It's gonna be like that for me. And she was trying. I appreciated that, but it was just never gonna be the same again. No matter what, I just knew life was never gonna be the same for me. So I didn't really have time to think about what city I wanted to go to. I just was. I was just overwhelmed with this anxiety of what, like, what is going on? Like, what is the world? This is my. This is my judgment moment. Like, it really feels like afterlife, and then you're going to the court to be judged. So it it sounds like you were you were not. I mean, it sounds like you were sad. Yes, I was. So, was it always like this? Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Candid with Candace Wiggins. Remember, you can subscribe to the Ultimate Hoops Podcast Network on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, and listen and download other podcasts like The Wild Card with Luke Hanlon, Recreation Nation with Reed Nelson. The Dream League Insider and the Short Corner Podcast. Thanks to Ultimate Hoops and Lifetime Fitness who made this all possible. If you want to learn more about Ultimate Hoops and all of our basketball products, go to uhlife.com. We'll be back next week with an all new episode of Candid with Candace Wiggins. <laughs>